guess I, I can take this off this morning. Thank you. Thank you all so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Um, it's been a strange and crazy year, and I haven't been able to be in churches as much as I would really love to, but it is an honor um, to be here today with you. And um, I enjoyed the first service, and it, it's just, I see a lot of familiar faces this morning. And so that's a huge blessing. Part of that's probably because of my, my background is um, actually, I like to give my testimony a little bit because it gives it a testament to God's glory and certainly not my own. And when we can't do things, God can do those for us or through us. And it also gives us an opportunity to let God's glory shine. And so four years ago, uh, this coming April, I was, uh, <clears throat> this is when I joined um, Pivotal Point. It was called Hillcrest then. So you all might know us as Hillcrest versus a pivotal point. And um, so what happened, I was working for um, Family, uh, Family Christian, and uh, it's a Christian bookstore. And as many of you know, if you shop there, which I've seen several faces that I met there, and so um, it, was, it announced in February that it was closing. Well, this is the second time I'd been through that process because I also had worked for Borders and Walden Books. And so it was kind of like, oh, okay, God, you know, tell me that I'm not going to go back into retail at this point. And, um, and what I did hear or felt, I felt it more than hear it. I think, you know, God brings his, um, his word to us in many different ways. But I think in, in this particular case, I could hear God just tell me to just kind of chill. And, th and then I needed to just let him take over and let him be the Lord and God that he is. And the verse that I heard, which I, you know, I, I've never spent a ton of time in Psalms. See, it's confession time today, because I know most people are like, oh, I just love reading Psalms. I find it very difficult for me, because I'm obviously not a very poetic person. But um, what I kept hearing was Psalm 46, verse 10. Be still and know that I am God. And what I tease a little bit about was there's what you, what you can't see there. It said, and Melissa, just stay out of my way. And, and isn't that true? Do we sometimes just not have to stay out of God's way and let him do what is best for us and best for his kingdom? So I um, backed way off the, oh, I've got to find a job. I've got to do my resume. And um, I, I, I just knew God was saying, you just got to just got to be still. And so about four weeks into this process, which was not my favorite thing, and I'd been through it once, um, I was, my husband and I both felt very calm. And about four weeks in, I get this phone call. And I, on the other end of that phone call, was a gentleman who was on the Pivotal Point, then Hillcrest board, who is still on our board. And he said, my wife shops there, and she said, maybe I should give you a call to see if you might be interested in speaking to us about Pivotal Point, then Hillcrest. And so I'm like, okay, God, because I've just told you that my background is retail. <laughs> and so um, this was, I'm not, I, I'm not come from this environment, and um Family Christian was a 501. I do believe that God was preparing me. Uh, when I turned 50 years old was when I, when borders closed, and I was, here I am, you know, having to find a job at 50, and I thought, well, what in the world, Lord, are you, are you going to lead me to? There's got to be more to my life. Y'all, be careful when you say, there's got to be more, because there is, and God has a plan. You know the scripture that God in Jeremiah 29, 11 says, for I know the plans I have for you. So I've learned that that's not a carrot dangling on a stick. You know, the plan, you're in the plan. You're constantly in the plan. You just allow God to lead you. You're constantly in that plan. And so five years down the road, here I am applying for a job and a not-for-profit. Um, and and uh, the only thing that was familiar to me was the thrift store, uh, which I was able to feel very comfortable in and, and be able to bring my expertise in that at least, because the other, not so much. But uh, God uses you, so keep that in mind. You are in the plan. When you say, God, I can't do it, he says, I know, because he can. 
and his glory will shine. So that's the beginning of, of this journey. And now we're fast forwarding from 56 to 60, and I don't mean the speed limit. Um, that's my age, and uh, it has gone in a flash. And so, um, and here I am. Uh, that first year, we, we, uh, we pivoted from Hillcrest to Pivotal Point um, because we wanted to be an entity that was just in this community. And so Hillcrest allowed us to do that. We are grateful for Hillcrest and we're grateful for the ministry that they, and the mission that they provided us, which started in 1979. Did y'all know that? Um, in 1979, three men gathered around a pastor who had um, been struggling to be sustainable. And um, they gathered around him and they said, so here's what's happening here. We want to help you, we, but we want you, we're going to hold you accountable. You're going to be working at this. You're going to put the work in. So those are really important concepts to the ministry. So it started with three guys and a pastor. And they helped this pastor through budgeting and saving and life skills to be the, the man God wanted him to be and to be able to, sustainable for his, to be sustainable for his family as well. And so that's how Hillcrest started, and then that's the basic mission of what we, um, of what we actually continue. Most importantly, remember, three men, three Christian men and a pastor. So um, that is where that started, and that's where we continue. So the interesting thing about what we do is... We want to, as Steve said earlier, we really want to add the, the contents of things that, that we take for granted. So who taught you how to clean your house? Your family did. Who taught you how to cook? Someone in your family probably did. Who helped you learn how to maintain your car? Probably someone in your family. So all the things that we take for granted that are super basic to us, we have to try to remember that not everybody had someone to do that for them. And so um, we start with life skills. We teach budgeting. And we also have case management. So I have a case manager that helps them uh, walk through the budgeting piece. And um, also just to go through life. Because the things that we take for granted are just someone being there. Having support system. Having having um, someone to have our backs. Well, my experience so far with, with my population, my people at 3000 Parkway A, is they don't have support. They don't have a family support. Often they have fallen into making bad choices because they are survivors. When I first started this job, I didn't tell this story this morning, but when I first started this job, I met with a, um, one of the directors from Kansas City, and he sat with me for probably three hours, and he said, you know, Melissa, he said, so let's just imagine you or I, and you and I are on the street. We've lost our job. That means we've lost our home. We've lost our car, and we have to figure out how to survive. He said, you and I probably aren't going to. They are going to, because that it's programmed into them. So the only problem with survival is you don't figure out how to thrive. So that's one of the things that we do through all the, the other things that we do for them, the budgeting, the accountability, um, the teachings, life skills, is we tell them, we don't want you just to survive. We want you to thrive. There's a big difference, isn't there? I mean, there's a big difference. Sometimes we don't feel like we're thriving. We just feel like we're surviving. And there's some truth to that. You know, God gives us the ability to do both. Um, but it, it is not necessarily in their nature because they are continually in survival mode. So wrap your head around that for just a second and, and do what that gentleman asked me to do, that friend of mine asked me to do, and to think, would I be able to survive? And the answer was, no, I probably wouldn't have been. So um, just to kind of continue into that thought is, here's where y'all come in. You are, um, you and the many other um, churches and businesses and people who believe in what we do, because 
we do throw around the, the slogan a little bit that, you know, we are hand up and not necessarily hand out. With that said, we provide um, an apartment for them for 90 days or plus. That's the nice thing about being our own entity. If I'm a mom with three kids and I've left an abusive situation and I've been told that I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't, you're not, you can't, you can't, you can't, um, you can't survive on your own. You can't hold a job. You don't have an education. It's going to be really hard for me to do that in 90 days. So we have that, um, we are very fortunate and blessed to have that, this provided for us by this community, because if it wasn't for this community, we wouldn't be able to do what we do. If it wasn't for the churches, we wouldn't be able to do what we do. Keep a couple things in mind. Um, 95% or higher of our funds come from, from the community. We do, not, um, we do not take the federal funding with the exception of one city grant that we get. We do not take federal funding because we wanna be able to serve this community by the community missionally. And so um, if, we, if we were to take a lot of the federal funding, we'd be limited on what we could do. So I just think it's important for y'all to know that. And I forgot that this morning too. So apparently it's been a while since I spoke and I can get my thoughts together a little bit better on the second round. Um, and so you are very needed. Um, and I say you very, you collectively, you, the church and, and the church. Um, because I've told you about all the physical things that we do. You know, it's important for us to help them and to help them change their physical address and to get them from survival to thriving, just surviving to thriving. And, um, but we also know that it would be very important for us, that it is very important for us, and we'd be very neglectful if we didn't focus on the eternal as well. So that's, a, you know, we, we want to be the hands and feet of Jesus, and we make sure that we're bringing that to them. I did tell this story that this morning is I think two years ago it, it was a reality check for me um, because I uh, I'd served a couple of foreign missions and and it was a good experience and it's important so I, I'm not speaking against that at all but I it was near Easter and we always do something for the kids for Easter but we try to implement and everything we do we try to implement the real meaning, the real meaning of Christmas, the real meaning of Easter, and, and so on and so forth. And so I had my little resurrection eggs. Y'all know the resurrection eggs? Well, if you don't have them, they're an amazing little, they look like a, like a carton of eggs, but each egg has something that represents the story of Easter. And so I thought, I march in, my kind of high and mighty probably a little bit, and I, and I have my resurrection eggs, and I thought, well, we're just going to tell the story of Easter, and the way I do that is I hand the eggs out, and I let the kids say, well, this is what's in this egg, and this is what this means, and, and uh, the reality check was that my mission is in my backyard, and it's at 3000 Parkway A, because they really did not have any clue at all what the representation of the crown of thorns was and what the real representation of the cross was and what the real representation of the empty tomb was. They did not understand that. Not the children, not the parents, not any of them. Not in that group. Now, you know, there are several that come to us that were possibly raised in the church and they do know, they have that sense. We all make mistakes and we all sin and, you know, no one's sin is greater or lesser, it's a sin's a sin, right? And so, um, so we show them that Jesus loved them and designed them. And, and what their past is part of their story does not define them. And so um, that's very important to us. And so I want you to know both sides of what we do, the physical and the spiritual. Um, so the other thing that we committed to a couple of years ago in the process of switching from a joint part of Hillcrest and a new director and um, having to separate, we decided we were gonna do a youth pilot program, ages 17 to 21-ish. We were still trying to figure that out at the time. And we've been doing that at our building, um, just sort of under the basic foundation of what we do. But what I have found is 
Um, I said I would never teach another teenager how to drive. Well, that is not true. Check that one. I uh, teach, I, I've taught, uh, so we've had probably about eight or nine youth come through the building and none of them, well, that's not true. I have, we had one come in this year that had her permit and I'm like, my case manager and I, her name is Lisa. Lisa and I were like having a party inside. This one knows how to drive and she has her permit. And so um, otherwise it was us. And then we found a glorious man. His first name is Jack and he loves to teach driver's ed. And he is my personal angel because I haven't had to do that in the last two. So, um, but you know, back to the seriousness of this, um, our community has a huge problem of homeless youth. And if you're 17 and you are homeless and you don't have a home, think about what your options are. There aren't any. You can't go to the crossing. You can't go to the Y. You, you, there aren't any. <laughs> there, there just aren't any. And so you're, you're couch surfing, which means you're invisible. No one even really knows that you're out there and that you're homeless. And so last year when we spoke to the school district, they talked, um, they have... They were having four, between 400 and 500 homeless youth. Now, this is all across the board. This is not teenagers. And because their definition of homeless is if their family didn't have a home and they were living with someone else. That's a huge number. They really couldn't even target the number of teens because they really are sort of invisible. With no place to go and nobody calling in that they're missing, if you're 17, you don't have to go home unless you commit a crime or unless someone actually is physically looking for you and wants you home, you're by yourself. So two things happened in 2020. One, we were, we were terrified in March of what the pandemic would do. And we were like, God's glory is going to shine here. When we can get to the end of the year and we put our faith in him and let his glory shine, when you, are, when you give up yourself, God can come in. And, and he, can, he can show his glory. And so one of the things I'm going to tell you is, in the, this is our 10-year anniversary, and uh, so that's amazing. And uh, your group is actually one of the first places that I'm announcing. We obviously had to buy two buildings in the 10 years that we were here. So we bought the apartment building and then we bought the thrift store. And um, we know that we have to practice what we preach. We preach that they, should, they have to save and that they have to pay off debt while they're with us. And so last year there was $37,000 saved and $50,000 paid off in debt collectively in 2020 by our residents. Now some of that's debt forgiven but they don't even know that they can do some of that. You know, I mean, if it's a hospital bill and, and they don't know that. So um, that's two of the big important things we do. We are debt free as an organization as of 2020. And so, um, yeah, you can clap. That is a big deal. And so um, that is no glory to anybody but God our Savior because none of it makes sense. Kind of like me telling you I came from a retail background, none of that really made any sense on paper, but that's what God does. And so um, just to give you, just to finish up here and give you just a few quick things. Um, first of all, I said, we need you. And I'm excited to talk about how you all want to do that. There are a zillion ways that, obviously I'm being dramatic, but there are a zillion ways that you can be involved. You can pray, you can, volunteer at the thrift shop. You can volunteer at the apartment complex. You can teach life skills. There's a whole list of things out there. And plus, I'm sure I'm going to be having some communication after today. Um, <clears throat> you can teach life skills, which if you taught your children anything, which you do every day, that's the kind of things that you can teach in life skills. Or you can do budget counseling. I mean, there's so many things. Um, I'm going to need some help in some yard work down by the apartment building in the spring. It, it's, it just, it, it goes on and on. Um, we function mostly on, by volunteers. We have, at the apartment complex, there's, um, well, there's four employees, and then I have a thrift store manager. 
and then I have a couple of part-timers. You know, I have three or four part-time, uh, four, I guess, uh, part-time employees at the thrift store. But that's it, because we want to be good shepherds and good stewards um, of our money and th that you trust us with. And so um, we are volunteer-driven. So you can see there's a big opportunity. Um, the one thing, just as an example of why it's so important to walk alongside, Steve mentioned this earlier, is, you know, the church is walking alongside our people is very important because, A, it is our goal to change their, their eternal address. Um, but for, in order for them to learn how to trust people and to realize that there is another way of life, not just the surviving. Um, so I see a lot of children. I saw a lot of children in here earlier this morning. And if you are ever sick or if you have a baby, what's the first thing this congregation does for you? Bring you a meal, right? Did I hear that? Yep, so they bring you a meal. Now that sounds like a really simple thing, doesn't it? But you enjoy it, don't you? I know that it's been a long time since I had my children, but um, that was a great thing. I can tell you that... I, I'm pretty confident to say, but I'll give it a little credit. I bet in my four years, I'll bet you there's been maybe one or two people that have ever experienced the support of someone bringing them a meal before they came to Pivotal. So it's the simple things, folks, that, that are a blessing. And it's weird for them. Can you imagine someone showing up, knocking on your door and bringing you a meal? When usually when someone's knocking on your door, it's not a good thing. So I'm just saying, walking alongside, we can tell when we have um, 15 transitional apartments, uh, 10, 11 of those are sponsored. And so that means that those apartments have someone from a church or an organization that walk alongside them. The success that comes out of the walking alongside is exponentially larger than the ones that don't have someone to walk alongside. And so there's so much that you can do, and, and we're just so blessed to be here. Last but not least, so we walked alongside 104 individuals last year. 45 or 6 of those were adults, then 47 were, so 44, anyway, adds up to 104. And 6, six of those were teenagers. We, we doubled them up, and um, so they live kind of apartment style, like it would be a dorm. And we also are going to announce probably later this year because we feel God has blessed us for a reason. And that's to continue the mission of the youth project. And so we will probably be announcing um, that we'll be starting a youth campaign very soon. Um, and 55% uh, of those who come into our building leave successfully. Now, you're like, what? 45% don't aren't successful in the program? Let me clarify that. First of all, 55% in the world of transitional housing is huge. It's huge. Um, but they're all a win because they've all been exposed to what they need to be to, to be sustainable, and they've all been ex exposed to the love of Jesus. And so um, thank you all very much for having me. Uh, by the way, just by shopping and donating at the thrift store, that thrift store is like almost a third of what our funding is. Now, it wasn't that way four years ago, three years ago, but um, it has grown, and it's because of people like you. And so shop and donate. We appreciate it. And um, I really appreciate being here, and I hope I didn't go longer than this morning. And um, I, I just can't tell you how honored I am to be here and to see so many familiar faces and to just know that you all want to walk alongside us. Oh, someone's raising their hand at me. Well, that is very lovely because it's literally right down Frederick here across from the cemetery <laughs> and next to the firehouse, the old American Legion building. So really, really close. All right. Thank you all so much. I appreciate you. Uh, love and blessings to you. Thank you so much, Melissa. And uh, that's powerful, powerful stuff. So. Uh, I'm going to invite our worship team to come on up, and in a moment we're going to pray for Melissa. But here's here's what we believe firmly here. Uh, as we go through this series on the, uh, the Sermon on the Mount uh, with Jesus, we're, we're, we're going to see that um, Jesus is talking about God's kingdom spreading and growing through individuals, 
and through people gathered together um, where uh, God's will is done on earth as it is in heaven. And, um, and so things like Pivotal Point are important ways for believers, for followers of Jesus, instead of yelling at the darkness, griping at the darkness, and just being disappointed with the darkness, these are ways that we do the good that brings God glory, and it brings God glory when people are thriving in the way that Jesus talks about in, uh, uh, in the Sermon on the Mount. And so this is a really, really powerful way that God is fighting the darkness in our world. And, uh, and I believe it firmly. So, um, so let's pray for Melissa real quick. Melissa, do you mind standing up for us? We'd usually get, gather around you uh, with our dirty hands and lay them on you. And somehow the Holy Spirit works through that. But uh, we'll, just, we'll just pray at you uh, from this distance. Heavenly Father, I thank you for Melissa. I thank you for the words that she brought. Words that are backed up by the truth of what they do. Um, and, and Lord, it's so powerful that lives are changed. And people uh, go from a circumstance of a poverty mindset to thriving. And we know it's not 100% every time, uh, but Lord, we have to remember us <laughs> and, and, that, uh, and, and that we're not 100% every time either. Um, by your grace, we pray for more lives to be changed this year than ever. And uh, we pray that you would give Melissa and her staff wisdom and guidance uh, and continue to lavish support upon them. And may we be a part of that as well. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Amen. Well, thank you so much, uh, Melissa. And oh, I just wanted to say, we've had a couple of, uh, one individual and one family go through um, Pivotal Point. One young man from here that went through, was in debt, had never owned his own car, um, never had his own bank account really or anything like that. Uh, went through Pivotal Point, came out with money saved for the first time in his life, and purchased his own car. And let me just tell you, in a personal conversation with him, that was like all the Christmas mornings in the world. He did not ever think he would own his own car. Imagine that. And so, God be praised through all of this. Let's stand and worship our King.